So as nice as it is to see everyone here today, I just want to acknowledge that there are a bunch of people who are watching you know, uh, over the internet. Um, I know a lot of legislative staff uh, are not here today, but I know they signed up and they're probably back at their offices watching on one screen and probably typing up legislation on, on the other screen. Uh, hopefully what you've heard today is that uh, the decarbonization efforts are complicated. Um, it takes you know, all of the above approach that um, our public utilities in the state are actively engaged and being innovative and in trying to do their best and use the best technologies to move us to our carbon future. But despite of all those efforts, there are a lot of advocates who are um, protesting and saying, just stop fossil fuels now. Uh, stop today, stop by 2030 or uh, whenever it is. But, but the reality is that it's much more complex than that. Michelle mentioned the geopolitical uh, situation in the world from uh, recent events and the war in Ukraine. And that has really made you know, the issue of fossil fuels that much more real for not only us, but for the entire world. Um, we tend to focus on New Jersey, but when we talk fossil fuels, when we talk petroleum, we're really talking about a worldwide industry, about a worldwide situation. Um, I, I recently you know, heard um, folks from the American Petroleum Institute talk about the worldwide flow of fossil fuels and you know, where you know, their markets are heading. So I thought it would be very valuable for, to have this crowd uh, you know, hear what they have to say and what the facts are as, as far as the use and the projected use of fossil fuels th um, throughout the world. So uh, we have today Rob Jennings. He is the Vice President of Natural Gas Markets at the American Petroleum Institute. He heads API's efforts on natural gas and LNG issues, as well as emerging technologies, including hydrogen, renewable gas, certified natural gas and carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, obviously, a big portfolio, a big topic, and we appreciate you being here today. Rob, come on up. Thanks, Ray, for the, the uh, great introduction. Um, I do have some slides here that I believe are coming up. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the American Petroleum Institute, we are the largest trade association representing uh, all facets of the oil and gas industry in the U.S. Um, we represent about 600 member companies that work in the upstream, the midstream, the downstream, and the service and supply um, fa uh, facets of that industry. Um, I do have slides. Okay, all right. Uh, and so what, what my group does specifically, which is a little bit different than um, kind of the traditional value chain that you think about for natural gas, is we look uh, and engage on policies that impact demand for natural gas. So historically, um, on the domestic side, that's been in the power sector, renewable portfolio standards, that type of thing. But increasingly, our work has um, focused on the export of liquefied natural gas. Um, as of last year, the U.S. is the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. That was uh, incredibly fortunate um, due to the events that Ray mentioned, the war in Ukraine. We were able to redirect a lot of the gas that we were shipping elsewhere to Europe uh, to prop their economy up, make sure their storage caverns were filled for winter. Um, so th that's, a, that's a, a bit on what we do. But um, today, I wanted to cover what we view as the future of natural gas and really focusing on kind of two key challenges that we see. Um, I think uh, the question that a lot of us are probably asking, uh, you've seen these headlines before, um, you could be forgiven for thinking that the natural gas industry is dwindling, it's on the decline, we we're using less and less gas every year. Um, you look at things like uh, state and federal efforts to ban natural gas in buildings, um, the, the constant delays, our inability to build pipelines, people calling for peak natural gas, peak oil, et cetera, um, the end of the fossil fuel era. But I think it's important to inject a little bit of um, reality into this. And in this case, the reality is that natural gas use in the United States is at an all-time high. If you direct your attention to the bottom left chart, um, that's the natural gas consumption across the U.S. for the last 22-ish years. You'll note we're up 73% since the turn of the century in 2000. And even, we're not just up, but that growth has accelerated in the past decade. That coincided with the birth of the shale era when we figured out how to pull gas very efficiently from rock. Um, there's been tremendous benefits from that, both on the economic growth side, on the climate side. Um, on keeping energy affordable. We have some of the cheapest um, energy in the world here. 
And um, what this has, again, been facilitated by, if there's, if there's one thing you take from this slide, it's our status as the number one producer of natural gas in the world has really facilitated this growth. And it's not just one sector that's growing. I know I mentioned the export sector, but if you now look at the pie chart on the right, we really have all sectors growing here. Um, so essentially, these are the five categories we typically think of uh, for, the natu for natural gas demand. Uh, residential, commercial, that's generally heating um, and cooling for your buildings. The industrial side, the power sector, the export sector, and then other, which is a combination of kind of uh, vehicle fuel, plant lease fuel, what pipelines use, et cetera. And each of four out of those five, everything that you see there with the gold medal, means that in 2022, we set a record for consumption. Um, so the bottom line here is that demand for natural gas remains very strong. Um, I think the power sector is something I want to focus on just a little bit because that's been one of the biggest winning stories for us. Over the past 10 years, we've made a very conscious effort in the country to retire some of our older, uh, higher emitting coal-fired power plants and replace them with more efficient, lower emitting gas plants. New Jersey was an early mover on that. You've got these big, beautiful, efficient gas plants up and down the state that continue to be very reliable. They backstop renewables, including the new ones that are going to come online, offshore wind, et cetera. So this has really been a success story. And if you just look back at the last 18 years, back to 2005, which is kind of what we usually benchmark our emissions reductions against, um, two-thirds of the reductions that we've seen have come directly from the switch from coal to natural gas in the power sector. We have reduced emissions in the U.S. more than any other country on Earth, and a big, big chunk of that has been the availability of natural gas, especially from the Shell Revolution. So that said, the industry remains strong, demand remains robust and resilient. We do have some challenges, and I'm going to highlight two challenges here. The first of which is infrastructure. I doubt anyone here uh, is hearing this for the first time, but it has become very difficult to build big infrastructure projects in this country, especially energy infrastructure projects. So if you focus on the map on the left, um, what the green area is, is the Appalachian Shale Basin. That's the second, the largest basin in the US for natural gas, the second largest in the world behind only Qatar. Um, and then if you look at the blue arrows, each of those represent a, an interstate natural gas pipeline project that has either been canceled or delayed over the past six to seven years. So I'm sure many folks in this room are familiar with the Penn East pipeline that was canceled a few years ago. The Constitution pipeline would have, would have taken gas from the, shale, uh, from the Marcellus and Utica Shale Basin to New York. The Atlantis, Atlantic Coast pipeline and Mountain Valley pipelines would have taken it from the, uh, those basins to the, the growing southeast market. Again, these are markets that need gas. The prices in those markets tell us that there's not enough gas in many cases. In fact, in the southeast, the utilities down there are looking, are actually having to delay their coal plant retirements because they can't get these pipelines built in time to uh, fuel new efficient gas-fired power plants that they want to build. So what is the, what's the consequence of our inability to get these pipelines built? If you now look at the chart on the right, this is Appalachian natural gas production for the last 12-ish years since the beginning of uh, 2011. You can see just how fast that basin grew. This, is, this basin alone is what gave us energy independence. It gave us our status as the number one producer of natural gas in the world. But So for the first decade, it grew like gangbusters. Um, but starting around three years ago, we started getting constrained in this region. We did not have the pipeline capacity we needed to move natural gas from this enormous producing basin to the markets where it needed to go. And that meant that production from that basin has flatlined. So we know the demand is there, but because we can't get that linchpin, these pipelines, that energy infrastructure built, this basin is really being constricted. And that's a challenge because when things like this happen, prices there fall and operators, these upstream producers who have to make big, long run investments, it, they can start to look elsewhere. So that's a big challenge we're facing. And I will point out here that right now, I think everyone probably is aware that the permitting reform efforts that we've pursued, that's been a big priority for API um, over the past two years. Um, natural gas pipelines have really been the banner issue there. But going forward, it's not just going to be gas pipelines that are facing these permitting challenges. It's going to be the electric infrastructure, the big interstate transmission lines that are needed to get all that we can get out of things like the Inflation Reduction Act, the big renewable growth that we're expecting to see. So 
As of right now, this is impacting the natural gas industry pretty um, acutely, but it will expand to other industries. That's why we think permitting reform uh, is a, a very key challenge that we face and a high priority for us. So to bring this home a little bit, um, I understand that that map and the gas production, that's not what you think about on a daily basis, but what these constraints, the inability to move gas from where it's produced to where it's consumed, how those do affect you as homeowners, as business owners, et cetera, is in energy costs at your home, uh, the, retail, the retail rates that you pay. And if you just look at this map, it's pretty clear. This is a heat map showing electricity, retail electricity rates um, by state for 2022, you can pretty easily see where the constraints are, where there's a shortage of natural gas. Natural gas is very, very critical in setting retail prices for electricity. So I think this is just a nice map. It reminds us that you know one or two pipelines into some of these constrained regions could go a long way to balancing what we view are these imbalances in the availability of natural gas and how they bleed through to retail electricity rates. So that's the first challenge again number one for us, infrastructure. But the second big challenge that we're seeing here is we are getting a barrage of regulatory, uh, of regulations, both state and federal, that are in many ways making it difficult for us to supply, to continue to produce natural gas and to do it affordably. Um, on the top here, I have what I'll call the headline grabbers. These are ones that you may have seen in the press over the last year or so. Um, the tailpipe rule, which would effectively require two-thirds of uh, new vehicle sales to be electric by 2030, uh, the power plant rule, which would require many existing uh, and frequently used natural gas-fired power plants to either retrofit with carbon capture or begin to blend uh, significant amounts of clean hydrogen, the methane rule, which would impact how we produce and move natural gas, and then onshore and offshore access, that's really a leasing issue, um, not super prescient in, in uh, in New Jersey, but there are also, in addition to these headline grabbers, there are a lot of other regulations. This is actually just a sample of all of the regulations that API has engaged on in 2023 alone. And one thing I wanna emphasize is <clears throat> these are a big deal for us, but we, we aren't anti-regulation. API supports the direct federal regulation of methane. We recognize that that's a key piece in solving the global climate change problem. Um, so we support that, but we want to make sure we have a seat at the table. We want to make sure that any type of regulation that does pass state or federal is aligned, is reasonable, is achievable, and can be done uh, in an affordable manner so that we don't see our position um, as the largest producer of natural gas. So those are the two key challenges um, that I wanted to highlight. And then I would be remiss not to go a little bit deeper on the global crisis that we're facing, the global energy crisis. Um, we were reminded of it again over the weekend with the attack in Israel. But looking back to the beginning of 2022, um, when Russia invaded Ukraine, for years, Russia had been the dominant supplier of natural gas into Europe. They, supported about, they supplied about 40% of Europe's total natural gas supply came from a couple pipelines from Russia into Europe. Um, as you all know, Russia invaded Ukraine last February, largely cut off those pipeline flows, and the havoc that that wrought on the European economy cannot be overstated. So if you look at this chart here um, at the bottom, these really are what we think of as the three global benchmark prices for natural gas. You can think of them as kind of the average wholesale price for natural gas. On the bottom, the green line, in, here in the US, we have what's called Henry Hub. In Europe, their marker is called TTF, the Tidal Transfer Facility, in Holland. And then in Asia, they have JKM, the Japan-Korea marker. You can see what happened to these natural gas prices. I've got the invasion pointed out last February, the shutoff of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, actually that should read Nord Stream 1 pipeline, uh, which happened last August. And you can see what that did to energy prices, again, these natural gas prices bleed through to everything on the industrial side, electricity prices, production of fertilizer, chemicals, glass, et cetera. Um, those prices spiked at their peak up to $100 per million BTU. If you think better in terms of oil or gasoline, that's about $600 per barrel of oil or $25 per gallon of gasoline. So um, pretty, uh, pretty impressive and shocking price movements there. Um, but then you look at down at the bottom, the green line, that's the U.S. So throughout all this turmoil, the U.S. stayed low. We stayed well below $10. Yes, we did increase a little bit compared to our long-term averages, um, but we stayed considerably below where the rest of the market is. I think this chart alone is a good reminder of 
the importance of energy security, producing the resources that you need here at home. Again, Europe will probably never fully recover from the invasion of Ukraine and the shutoff of natural gas. They lost a considerable amount of their heavy industry and the jobs associated with that industry. Um, that's not coming back, and I think it's a good cautionary tale for us as we think about how do we how do we maintain energy security while continuing down the path of energy security? So <clears throat> just to wrap up, a couple key takeaways. Um, first and foremost, as we, as we saw on this first slide here, demand for natural gas remains very strong and very resilient in the face of these global crises, in the face of the energy transition, um, the, the, the regulatory onslaught that we're facing. Demand remains high, um, and this should be Policymakers need to keep this reality in mind as they're pursuing policies that could potentially impact our ability to produce natural gas, our ability to move it in pipelines, and that sort of thing. Um, which brings me to the second point on infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. I can't say it enough. We need the ability to move energy from where it's produced to where it's consumed to avoid the imbalances that I showed you on that heat map. Those imbalances are very, very tough on businesses, on homeowners. We need this ability to move it. And again, as a reminder, right now, this is largely a natural gas infrastructure issue, but it will bleed over into other industries. And then finally, policy certainty is going to be key to maintaining stability in these energy markets. Thinking back to the regulatory, uh, the slide showing all the regulations that our industry is facing, it's a little bit hard sometimes for us to square the amount of regulation we're facing that is often very restrictive with some of what we're hearing, especially from the administration on, yes, we understand gas is very important. We need to send it to Europe so to, to keep their economy afloat. We know gas is a big part of the energy transition here. So consistent messaging from policymakers, um, a clear signal about how they view the role of natural gas in the energy transition. Um, that's going to be key to maintaining stability in our, in our industry allowing member companies to, to make confident investments in supply for the future. So that's all I have. Thank you. So Rob, that, that was extremely thoughtful. We, we have time for some questions. Um, any questions from the audience? Everyone's all bought in on natural gas? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, very good presentation. Thank you very much. I have one simple question. Uh, in your pie chart, you mentioned about, you know, 11 percent, uh, I mean, natural gas is being used for the, you know, energy for the homes, heating, right? And then you mentioned the power. But if you're going to go with the mandate of electrification now and next 10 years, so your power, you know, generation is going to increase. So what portion of that power increase? is going to be burning fossil fuel, and what portion is going to be renewable you know, energy? Because that's the key here for re reduction of CO2. I mean, so if you can help me with that. Yeah, so I think just to, to restate the question so everyone can hear it, um, electrification, we've all heard that. That's a big thing in New Jersey. It's a big thing across many states. Right now, this is what our electricity pie looks like. But as we electrify, that pie actually gets bigger. And I think the, the, the underlying question was, what share of the of the power generation is going to come from fossil fuels versus renewables. It's going to be different in every state. That's not a question I can answer. I think New Jersey is further along in its energy transition than many other states, especially nearby states. So it's likely going to come from a higher share of renewables here. You're blessed to be on the coast. You can build big offshore wind farms. Um, that's, going to, that's going to tremendously offset the need for fossil fuels. But I do think keeping natural gas available and in the stack is going to be key to prevent a fallback to coal in some places, like we saw in the southeast. They can't get natural gas down there right now. They can't get sufficient natural gas, so they're keeping their coal plants on longer. And that climate story is, is very difficult. Is that helpful? Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, my question is that uh, as we are transitioning into uh, the future, whatever the future might be, and um, there is a lot of there's going to be tremendous amount of uh, stranded costs. Uh, or the policymakers you are talking to are looking at the stranded costs and how they're going to affect the 
low-income uh, rate payers, our consumers? So we at API generally represent the upstream, the midstream, the downstream, not the utility side. So we don't have the same type of stranded costs, especially those that could be visited upon ratepayers. So I don't have a good answer to that. I'll turn it to the folks on the utility side. I know that's a big issue, especially on the, on the gas pipeline side. But I think a few folks from the utilities mentioned that some of these pipelines can be repurposed um, if you make the investments to convert them to lower emitting fuels like, like clean hydrogen, renewable natural gas, et cetera, um, even, even to move carbon from carbon capture facilities. So I think there's innovative ways to avoid that from happening. But again, that's a little bit outside of my, uh, my expertise. Yeah, Rob, let me just jump in with, with a question. So uh, you, you, you're absolutely right. Here in New Jersey with the Shell Revolution, um, you know, we not only saw a, a decrease in natural gas prices, electricity prices, um, we also saw, you know, a decrease in our carbon emissions as our old coal-fired plants were shut down and, you know, replaced with new natural gas plants. I, I think at this point, I'm not sure if we're burning any coal at, at all in New Jersey, maybe for a couple of peakers, but they may be closing down as well. But we also saw an uptick in manufacturing because uh, the, the feedstock, you know, prices were lower, the electricity. Uh, the price of energy was lower, and yet you've mentioned what's going on in Europe, I think especially Germany, and I believe uh, United Kingdom as well, is they're seeing a deindustrialization. A lot of people are cheering for that, you know, quite, quite frankly. I think a lot of the advocates like deindustrialization. Uh, I'm not sure. We definitely don't uh, believe in the uh, deindustrialization here at NJBIA. Can you talk a little bit more of what's gone on in Europe as far as losing their manufacturing base? Yeah, we actually met um, last week with the German Chamber of Commerce, um, and they pointed out that, you know, we asked them, what is your outlook for, for business in Germany? And they said, looking out at the next 10 years, it's very hard to be optimistic about anything. They see no sign of falling energy prices. Um, and they're the ones that gave us the stat that the chemical industry in Germany, which is the second largest industry behind the automotive industry, is down 20% since pre-invasion. Um, again, this is a risk you take by not producing the energy you use at home. Um, that's something we want to avoid here. I think Germany was probably the most industrialized country in Europe um, at the time, so they probably faced the brunt of this. But high energy costs there are not going away. I mean, they're going to be very, very reliant on imports for a long time, even as they have accelerated their energy transition uh, in the wake of the invasion. So is that helpful? Yes. Is that um, again, I, it's, it's lessons learned you know, for, for, is, for yeah. all of us. It's a, it's a sad but cautionary tale, I think, for the U.S. about energy security. We have time for one more question. Hey, Rob. Ted Bohr uh, from Princeton University. A really nice presentation. We still burn, even in our path to decarbonization, we still burn a lot of natural gas. And all of us, including yourselves, are trying to reduce our carbon footprint. Separate from the actual combustion of natural gas, can you talk about what the industry is doing uh, to reduce its own carbon footprint? And I'm thinking compressors, they, all the way from extraction sure. to the delivery point, separate from the combustion of the gas, uh, what you folks are, are working on there. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think when a lot of us think about natural gas and the emissions from it, we think about when you combust it, you get a certain amount of carbon out. But there are other, are other emissions along the value chain that we recognize and that we're taking uh, meaningful steps to try and address. Um, methane is, I think, the, the big one. Um, when you produce natural gas, we do a very, very good and efficient job of it, but some of it does leak. Uh, methane has a higher uh, uh, greenhouse gas potential than carbon, which is why it's so important to capture that. So um, we're taking steps to, um, we're, we're innovating candidly around ways to reduce methane emissions at the, what we call the, um, uh, the, the production site. Um, the wellhead, sorry. Um, and then along, the, along the, the transportation side, so the midstream side, there are opportunities for methane to leak. So we're looking at essentially tightening valves, making sure we have the right uh, monitoring equipment there, monitoring measurement and verification equipment along the lines. And the compressor stations, which is actually what moves, what makes the natural gas move along the pipeline, uh, historically have been fueled by natural gas or other fossil fuels. A lot of our member companies are electrifying those and then buying renewable energy credits to fully green the way that they move this natural gas. So we are looking at a lot of ways to not just reduce emissions on the combustion side, but along that whole value chain. So thank you. That's a great question. And we at API are avid readers of the Net Zero Lab research, so we appreciate that. Rob, 
Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks.